do 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 bow 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 pulling it up making adjustments full screen all right let's see how this looks all right all right Nick jumping on early here for the screen test nothing wrong with that how you doing Nick man long time no see say something <laughs> What is this game? Nick, this? Well, that's the whole reason we're here today, my friend. This is Viking Chess, also known as Nefetoffel. And we're going to be talking about Nefetoffel and where it comes from and what it's all about and how it works, because there's a lot going on here. It's, it's a whole new beast. All right? So, if you could, how is the sound quality? Anyone who's watching already or, or viewing it? Are we able to hear everything fine? Should I turn off? I can turn off the air conditioner, but if it's not a problem, I, I wouldn't mind keeping it. We're gonna be getting into this thing momentarily. I think I might. I can survive without for a little bit. It's for the people, it's for the views. All about the gram. Alright, we got a heart already. A like. It was a heart, turned into a like. <laughs> That's okay. Alright, sounds good. Alright, I hope you enjoy, Nick. Nathan, I see Nathan. Has tuned in. Martin, cool sound. Cool sound. Alright. We try. We do try here at South Mount YMCA. I try to have a bit of it all working out but we're at about I'm at about four o'clock p.m. my time so for those of you watching or if you're just tuning in um, welcome for another uh, rousing edition of online camp classroom uh, today we're going to be hitting on another oddity board game another one of my favorites and uh, this particular game I was telling Nick earlier all right it's called uh, Nefetal or Nefetafel. All right, it's a uh, variant of Tafel game, which we'll talk about that in a second. Um, it's, uh, but it's most commonly known as Viking chess. A lot of people call it Viking chess because it, it comes from that region, that time period, all right? So this game traced back all the way back to roughly 400 CE. And uh, 400 CE was a crazy wild time in Europe, all right? Um, during that time, that was uh, when you had the, the Saxons, and uh, you know, it was not long after the fall of the Roman Empire, um, the, the beginnings of uh, the organizing of the uh, Holy Roman Empire was, you know, was shortly to come kind of a situation. Um, and this specifically comes from, you know, it originates in central and eastern Sweden from roughly, you know, 400 BC or CE, as some say, or if you want to be more particular, 550 to 793 CE was when it was really popular. Um, just before the Viking Age. All right, so we're talking about the Saxon Age. Um, members of the Vendel culture were known for their fondness for boat burials, wars, and their deep abiding love of Nefetopel. <laughs> that's, a, that's a direct quote from the Smithsonian, which I just find hilarious. All right. Uh, it's also known as, like I was saying earlier, it's also known as Viking Chess. Uh, Nefetafel is a board game in which a centrally located king, which is this guy right here, is the only king on the board. All right, he's a pretty cool little dude. 
wonderful craftsmanship. All right. All right, so you have a centrally located king who is attacked from all sides. Oh, he's encircled. All right, the game wasn't exclusive to the Vendels, although they were known for it. They were first discovered with it. People across Northern Europe faced off over the gridded board from at, at least 400 BC until the 18th century. Uh, it was kind of its heyday of popularity. But during the Vendel period, uh, love for the game was so great that some people literally took it to their graves. Now, a new analysis of some Nefetafel game pieces unearthed in you know, Vendel burial, burial sites um, has offered unexpected insight into the possible emergence of industrial whaling in Northern Europe, which is a really cool linkage um, just with the development of culture in that region because with the pop-up of uh, whaling in general and industrializing it, so to speak, uh, by going that route, that's you know, a big portion of turning away from nomadic cultures to uh, more established cultures. So, uh, the, you know, the building of uh, the, the building of big cities, uh, the processing of land, uh, turning towards more agricultural bases and uh, setting up, you know, more, uh, uh, you know, more designated territories in the region between the different clans and tribes and, and social groups, uh, which is a really cool history item. Um, so how this game is, you know, let's talk about the board, the basic setup here. All right. Cause you're all probably looking at it and it's like, oh, that's a cool little board. So this is uh, a very basic set that I actually got from the, uh, national, I ordered online from the national museum of Scotland. Um, don't let that intimidate you. You could very easily make your own board to the specs that I'm about to, you know, recite out to you guys. Um, and you could use stones, you know, you, they've. I've seen some people who did it where all the pieces were <laughs> were just pebbles, stones, similar to our Mancala video from before. Um, and you would just paint the required number of pieces one color and paint or don't paint the other number of pieces another color. And then for your king, just make sure it's a very uh, standout or particular stone in appearance so that you can tell the pieces apart for play. All right, so this is an 11 by 11 board. All right, but this particular board is just cloth which is kind of, it's kind of cool. You can roll it up and do whatever you need for it. So very, very easy to transport. All right. So uh, one of many, you know, this is just one of many versions of uh, a more generic game called Toffel. So Toffel is a Norse word for stone <laughs> and it's relatable to the German word of Toffel meaning table. Um, and it is a tabletop game, which I just find amazingly ironic and hilarious. Personally, and as I said, it's 11 by 11 grid. All right, and on each board, whether whatever version of Toffle it is, typically you have five very particular, you have five very particular squares, and those are the corner squares, which have a very particular um, emblem printed onto them or engraved into them or however it's indicated, and a central square, and they have the same emblem on all five squares, and those squares can only be occupied by the king. All right, and we'll talk a little more about that as we go into just how this game is played and the meaning and the, the point of those squares, okay? So as you can see, there are 24 attacking pieces and they're all relatively the same design. The only really big difference between them is on this model is appearance where some of them have little shields and some of them just little swords, but they're little, just these little Viking Raider looking dudes, which is pretty cool, these little warriors. All right, so you have 24 of them six on each side all right and so that's your offensive side that's your, the attacker all right notice they don't have a king because they're coming in they're raiding they're taking over some land man and then on the opposite side you do have a king you have 12 defending pieces little dudes all right and you have a king piece who starts in the middle all right and the king piece as you can see you know he is very you know he's a little he's definitely bigger easily twice as big and he's a lot more detailed he's got a really cool cape and a longer you know almost tower shield his sword and a really cool little face on him all right and so these are the defenders all right so the idea is you need to get your king if you're the defenders the, the white side you need to get your king uh safely to one of these corners without being captured um or engulfed or overwhelmed by the attacking side, these darker pieces, these brown pieces. Um, 
I just can't get over the quality of these little pieces. I think they're just too cool. Um, you know, even though I know they're just the you know, little resin moldings, but it's still, it's really cool. Um, sorry, geeking out, having a little nerd moment there. So 24 attacking, 12 defending, 1 king, 37 pieces on the board overall, 11 by 11 board. All right, pieces move vertically and horizontally, similar to uh, the, the castle or the rook in chess. So that first opening move, I can move in a straight line either way, but I cannot move diagonally, okay? So if this piece happened to be here, just for to show you, all right, I can move him in a straight line either way, and I can go as far as the board limit or until I run into another piece, then I have to stop, all right? Um, but he cannot move diagonally, if that makes sense. Kind of trying to demonstrate and show you guys. Here, let's see, I have my little pencil. All right, so they can't move diagonally, but they can move in straight lines. All right, again, just like a rook or a, a castle in the game of you know, the traditional game of chess, which is uh, kind of sets things up a little better. The king, now all pieces can move that way. So even the king, um, and again, they can move as far until they either hit the boundary of the board, one of the four sides, or they hit another piece. And they don't have to go the full length. They can go as far as you really want them to, depending on what you're trying to do when you're developing your, your pieces strategically on this board. All right, so pieces move vertically, which is always good. Um, rather than capturing other pieces by uh, taking over an occupied square, uh, you capture them by overwhelming them. And what does that mean? Well, let's say, for example, um, let's say, for example, this piece was just out in the open here, this little open area. To overwhelm him as the attacking side, I would have to get a piece, all right, on um, two side, two opposing sides of him. And it could be like that, or it could be maybe somehow we got him like that. And I'd have to move a piece in to create the capture. And so I take that piece off the board, all right? Now, if for some reason, say for example, those pieces were already there though, and this guy happened to be there, we'll say for demonstrative purposes, I can move him in and he's not captured, all right? Unless this guy happens to do a move back in one direction or another and then come back into it to then capture, all right? So I can move into a location in overwhelming position and still keep my piece but if they move into a position to overwhelm a piece they capture it and it goes both ways so that's how the attacking side would capture the defending side pieces and vice versa that's how the defending side pieces would capture attacking side pieces by setting up an overwhelm to capture the piece but like i said you can move into an overwhelming position where you're surrounded you're uh, confronted from two sides and be perfectly safe, okay? All right, standard pieces, um, you, know, you go about getting the opposing sides. Kings, though, the king is a little different. So in order to capture the king, all right, instead of it just being two pieces, all right, it has to be four pieces. All right, and the exception to this is if we were up against the sidewall, then it could only, then... It only has to be three. But if I can get three of my attacking pieces surrounding the king, I capture the king, I win the game. All right, another interesting item on this we'll talk about real quick, all right, is these corner pieces. I'm gonna have to move my, my dudes out of the way real quick to demonstrate this. All right, so if you look at the center piece, so these uh, rosette looking pieces or squares, my, my correction, my bad. All right, these rosette squares looking, this is just your staging ground for your pieces. And it's a different looking one for the attacking side, right? All right, but these, these squares with this really cool crosshatch, all right, which make up the center square and the corner squares. So your starting pot point for your king and the potential safeties, you know, the capsules where you can get away to all right, those locations, as long as there's no king there, all right, so say I had a, a white piece that was still here, if I moved an attack, if an attacker came up, 
that square, the king's throne, is what we call the center one. So the king's throne can act as a substitute technical piece, allowing me to capture that white piece. All right, because they would that would be the same as if I had another piece there and could capture them. But if the king is still occupying or occupying that square, it obviously doesn't count in their favor. All right. But you can use the king to capture pieces. Okay. So. So that's their throne. These are the castles you're trying to escape to. So you can win the game as the defending player. It makes it for a pretty interesting game. I've been playing. Uh, I've played it before. Before doing this. But I've also. Since I got the board obviously. Because I am a tabletop and board game geek. To the to the max um i've been playing this game just against myself practice wise similar to what you would do with chess and it's just been all sorts of interesting scenarios all right um and you must move a piece uh in the overwhelm you know it's if, if again you know if you move that um so how do you win the game what are all the ways that we can win all right so what this comes down to is you can win by domination if you're the attacking dark pieces you can win by escape as a defending pieces, or there can be a draw. There's a, almost every game out there, there's a way to have a draw. Now, to obviously to win as the defending white pieces, the goal is you gotta, you gotta, no matter what you have to sacrifice, you wanna get this king to one of these four corners. All right, and that means safety, that means the end of the game, that means white has been successful, has thwarted the invasion, the attack, and has survived, and the king lives to see another day. All right, now that's an escape. The dominations by these dark pieces, all right, is obviously to capture the defending king, you know, to get him surrounded by your pieces and, and capture him. All right, he's ours, we got him. All right, so that's one way to get it. The other way, apart from something similar to this, wherever that may happen on the board, all right, would be a complete domination. Now, what does a complete domination mean? Well, complete domination means you've somehow gotten all your pieces as <laughs> as the attacker into a situation where no matter where they go, they can't overwhelm or capture one of your pieces and escape the circle. And if they can't escape the circle, they can't get to their escape corners to their castles, to the safety, to survive and win the game on their own. So that is called a complete domination, completely encircled them, all right? Now that's a, a tricky thing to do, all right? Um, playing through a couple of uh, what-if games on my own time, um, I've come to realize that, is it possible? Yeah, it's possible, but it is tricky. You gotta really play the board and be able to, you know, throw down... <laughs> to kind of keep your opponent corralled and stuck so they can't get out. And it does, you need to maintain a significant number of your pieces to do it. All right, so you could capture the king, you do complete encirclement, um, and that's how the attacker can win. Uh, or if you get your king to one of these corners, that's an escape, that's how the defending white pieces win. But there's also a draw. Well, a draw, it's hard to place the board into a configuration to show a draw, but a draw essentially would come down to it where no one can really make a move. So if both players are unable to make a move for some reason, because of just the circumstance of the board, that's a draw, obviously. Or if you get yourself stuck in repetitive motion where you both just keep moving the same one or two pieces back and forth, back and forth, um, trying to go back and forth with each other, if that goes on for too long, that's also considered a draw, and you would just restart the game or call it as a draw right then and there. All right? Um, and you probably want to, you know, with all the options that could come up with here, the more you think about the game, how do you get to a draw, believe it or not, is more possible than you think. <laughs> it, it pops up a little more than I thought it would in practicing. All right. Now, just for the history aspect of things, something I've... I thought would be fun to do on this um a little world history to go in with you guys is looking at a map now it's not the best map it's a map i kind of was able to find and look at so this is a map 
indicating some cool stuff that was going on in the time of, you know, that we're talking about the time frame in history that we're talking about when this was all going down, uh, when this game was so popular. All right. Now, Sweden, where uh, our wonderful, <laughs> all right, where our wonderful Vendels were hanging out was mostly right up here, Sweden, Norway, and Skane. All right. Now, where all the action was happening, you know, because this was pre-Viking invasion, so the Vikings were coming from this region in general, all right? You know, that Denmark, Norway, Sweden region, multiple kings, a lot of back and forth, infighting, sending, you know, Viking warship, you know, warships to, to raid and pillage, all right? Meanwhile, down here, along the coast, all right, this is where we had the Saxons, and the Saxons were pushing and colonizing and, and modernizing and doing their job over their their job over in England and you had the Pictish and you had the Irish up here to the Northlands and so there was a lot of conflict in this region um, and typically you know <laughs> when you look at it you know a lot of people are like oh why do you have certain themes in the video in the, the games um, it's just because you know that was kind of the nature of the day during the, the time period when this was a popular game one of the reasons it gets depicted the way it does um, is because of all the conflict that was going on at that time. All right, and uh, like I said, it was just before the Viking Age really hit and the Vikings started going into England. Um, but it was a popular game that you'd find you know, all over. Um, it's it spread all over and across Europe, uh, so it wouldn't be far-fetched to think that uh, potentially it was seen um, by those who travel the Silk Road and things like that, and even people in the Mediterranean regions um, and Northern Africa. Now, this isn't the only version of Tafel, all right? So, like I said, this is Nefetafel, which is an 11 by 11 with the 37 pieces, etc., etc. There's a couple different versions of this, okay? So there's, uh, there's Branduf. <laughs> there's, if anyone's better at pronouncing these names, feel free to comment in the... <laughs> Uh, in the comment section, I know I, I could I could easily be butchering some of these. Um, so there's Branduf, which is on a uh, seven by seven board. There's only eight attacking pieces and four white defending pieces. So it's a it's a smaller, more compact version of the game. There's Ardri, which is played on also a seven by seven board. All right, but you have twelve attacking pieces. And nine defending pieces. All right, and I can even to show you guys what these would have looked like. It's going to be on an eleven by eleven, but bear with me as we go into it. All right, so Ardy or Ardby would have been more of something like this in appearance. All right, just to give you some perspective on it. All right, and then you have tablet. I'm saying it tablet. I'm going with it. All right. Now, tablet was uh, also on a, it was actually on a nine by nine board. And it has similar setup to our, our, our <laughs> I'm trying to say it. I know I'm butchering it. If we have any Swedish viewers, I apologize. Um, all right. Which was set up more like this. All right. And then you had a uh, 12 bird, which 12 bird was actually kind of interesting. Okay. So 12 bird had the same, almost the same setup for the defenders. And you can play, you know, these games had very similar rules. So these were just different ways of playing, different arrangements to play in for what your preference was, because uh, everyone has a preference, you know. Uh, it's it's kind of like Uno, you always gotta sit down and clarify with all your friends, okay, what rules are we playing by? Are we playing backyard rules, official rules? All right, so this is Tolbert, all right? And then Henfetafel, as we were going back to that basic setup. Very cool game. All right. And then there's a, another one which I don't have the space to set up. It's called Aaliyah Evangeli. Um, and again, I could be mispronouncing those. You know, pardon me if I'm, you know, Mike and Jeff, maybe you guys know a little better than I do. But Aaliyah Evangeli was very similar in as far as like that it was a, a preset board, but it has similar rules to a game called Go. 
And Go is played off a, a much bigger grid. We're talking something that's similar. I, I want to say, if I remember right, Go is played on a 19 by 19 square grid. <coughs> so much bigger. All right. And instead of the pieces, though, in Go, the pieces, instead of being in the squares, ride on the intersections. So imagine all the pieces staged on intersections, but played, again, with similar rules as far as um, how the pieces affected each other, how to do a capture, how to play. Um, Go is a really cool game. Maybe in a later video we'll, uh, we'll visit that a little bit and we'll play around with Go. All right. Now, the last thing I want to do, since we got about seven minutes left, take a sip. We have about seven minutes left in our video here today. So the last thing I want to do is do a little mock game playing in front of you guys. Um, I'm just going to keep it simple. I'm not going to get too clever or crazy against myself here. Now, after you've set the board, you've agreed upon which variation of arrangement you're playing. All right. Um, a lot of board games, you know, it's the piece you touch first is the, for your move is the piece you move. So we'll try to play by those rules. Um, but uh, how it works out is the attackers, because typically the attackers would have the... Uh, the, uh, the privilege of surprise, you know, surprise attack. All right, so the attackers always get to go first. In traditional chess, the white pieces get to go first. Not so much in Viking chess. In our Viking chess here, the these dark or black, brown pieces are the ones that get to go first. All right, and you're surrounded. You can move any, each turn you have, you can literally move for your move, whichever piece you want, as long as it makes sense to you or whatever you're trying to do. Um... And so you might make a move to just kind of, you know, this first move is really just kind of, you know, let's poke the bear and see see what's going on. Because until the white uh, defenders really make a decision on where they're trying, you know, where they decided, okay, what square am I going to try to make my push towards? It's really, you know, you really don't know where you want to force all your pieces. Um, so again, you know, I'm going to go ahead and make this move where I'm going to bring this attacker up. And again, he's only in danger if he gets surrounded by opposing on opposing sides by the other team and gets overwhelmed. All right, so he's perfectly safe there. No one can touch him. No one can move diagonally to get him because remember we can only move in straight lines. Okay, so now White's going to want to make a piece. So as a White, as the defenders, it's like oh snap, we're surrounded. We got to make a move. Let's let's start arranging our pieces. Now he made a move here. He's already. Uh, made it, you know, started to move pieces on this side, so maybe it makes the most sense to start moving pieces on this side. All right, so now as the attacker, going back to the attacker, now it's the time where I need to make a move that makes sense. All right, so maybe I'm foolish, I decide to go there. All right, so white maybe takes advantage of the moment, moves the piece, does a capture. Now, you see what happened there? Um, We'll, we'll rewind. All right, so the attackers moved here. Foolish move, maybe, because now the defenders can move one piece over, which creates an overwhelm, which captures the piece. All right, now what's the attacker going to do? All right, yeah, look, do I have a uh, circumstance where I can make some moves? Let's see. Now, and as the attacker, remember, you overwhelm the defender. So if you lose a couple pieces, it's not the end of the world. Because remember, it's... All, all to the wall at all costs, we want to capture the king. Same as how with the defending pieces, it's all to the walls, what, nothing matters as long as we protect and secure the king. All right, so for the attackers, maybe I'm gonna make a move. I'm gonna make a move and start pushing over here as a distraction, we'll say. All right, so as a white side, I got two options. I could do another capture move, but bring this guy over. Um, which is going to take him out or I could continue opening up trying to get uh, a, You know a, a, an avenue of advance for my king to the corner I'm gonna go ahead and do a capture move So we're already up two pieces the closer as the defender the closer I can bring it to a balance Where we have the same or he has less pieces the better because it puts me in more advantageous control of the board, right? All right, so it's uh, okay. What are we going to do? So what we could do is make this guy move up, and we'll, but we'll only go there. That way, now on White's turn, 
he doesn't really have a move to capture this piece or put that piece into, into harm's way. So that's a good thing for us. All right, so what's white gonna do? Well, maybe we're gonna move up and we're gonna start opening a path for the king to make his way to the corner. All right, so what's white gonna do? White moved out there, so what's that gonna do? Well, now we're going to make a move. Now remember, if I move into an overwhelmed position, it does. I don't lose the piece because he moved into it. They would have to reestablish to re to overwhelm and take that piece. So he's actually safe moving up here into this position between these two uh, defending pieces. So now he's got to make a decision. What are we going to do now? Well, maybe the best move is to go ahead and bring this guy over here. And we'll look and see if that works out later. All right, so now it's blood. It's the attacking move again. So what, what, what is the attacker trying to do? What are we trying to push for? Well, what we can do, because remember, we brought this guy up, and he was safe. They couldn't take him just for moving into an overwhelmed position. Remember, we have to create overwhelming positions. But by bringing this guy over, we've overwhelmed this white piece. Not a bad deal. All right, and that's a bad thing for the white for the defenders because we need all the pieces we can get we're overwhelmed right you know we're outnumbered so now what's white going to do to respond to that well again we can do a lot of focus and remember we're trying to open up this area so we can get over here and we're taking a piece because we brought this guy in into a position where he, it's overwhelmed but it was in an act to overwhelm that piece all right so where do we want to go well for the attackers, they don't have any pieces they can directly bring in to flip-flop that again. So what we could do, we want to slow down their advance to opening that up, right? So we're going to move that guy up. All right, so what's White going to do? What, you know, what's the next best move? All right, well, at this point, it might be a good idea to start moving our king. But we also want to keep whittling away at their forces to open things up. So we'll move this guy over, capture this piece. All right, that puts four down for the attacking side. Now, attackers, what are we going to do? Uh, well, now we got to make a move so that we can kind of, we still want to continue to slow down and clutter this up, which we totally can do, with simple little mo movements like that. All right, so now what's white going to do? Well, white's going to want to bring a piece up here. All right, so we'll go ahead and move our king. We're at a decent part where we're, we see an opening, two moves, two more moves than we could get there. Now the attackers are gonna see that as well, so they're gonna to wanna to block it, all right, the best way they can. Now, white has a decision to make, because if we move up here, obviously we can't just take the piece, but if we move up here, we don't have to worry about being overwhelmed yet, because remember, for the king piece, they have to get overwhelmed on four sides, or if they're along the wall, it has to be on three sides, all right? So we can go ahead and make that move, all right? And they can make that move up and try to block us out. It won't really matter. But what they can do, attackers on the back, on this front row, move on over. All right, so now the king has to make a decision. We could go up there. They won't have us on this side, but they could potentially surround us on the others. All right? So we need to think outside the box, because remember, there are four squares that we can go to to get safety. And right now, the king is one move away from winning this thing. All right. So right now, you could argue that it doesn't really matter what the attackers do. They could go ahead and just move and take that piece. We're going to move our king to safety, and we've won already. I don't know how many moves that was. I lost count. Honestly, I was, I was too focused on playing two sides of the board here. But that essentially for all intents and purposes, is your introduction to a game of uh, Nefetafel. I hope you guys really, <coughs> excuse me, I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope everyone's staying safe at home. Um, I know all of us here at camp are thinking of all of you. Um, thanks for joining us again on Online Camp Classroom. Um, we should be putting out a uh, schedule for the rest of the week before you know it. Um, so until next time, you know, I hope you guys have a wonderful day. And uh, stay safe out there.